She stands over here and not over there. That's true. Actually, I can do that. Anybody from the 80s after class is exactly like Jeff Lover if you want to know. Hey, Jen. You want me to get closer and see? I don't want to don't not get the volume. So I've only done public speaking. This is the second time in my life that we she, know that about me, and that I overcame my fear of public speaking because this is so important to me. So I talk really fast. Russell makes fun of me because he says I talk briskly. I'm originally from New Jersey, so anybody from this area knows it's just normal. But we're in the Midwest. They're like cross-eyed when I talk. I'm like it's just normal where I come from. So like you all will probably be fine complaint. with it. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So, you want me to turn off a light? Yeah, this is, oh, test it. It works. Okay. Thanks. I'm Jennifer Reed. Everybody calls me Jenny. I'm from Kansas City, originally from the East Coast, but I grew up in the Midwest. I'm kind of a weirdo because I have, I bore easily, so I have a lot of, experience. once I gain some knowledge, I think I'm, I'm moving on to the next thing. Um, so I want to talk about the passion of my life, and it's because of Jenna that I came on to this. This is all because, everything that I'm going to talk about now is because of this test. It changed my life, my entire family, everybody I know, all my colleagues. You just have no idea. What I'm going to tell you today, you need to listen to me. Because I don't think you understand, and I want you to. Okay, so I am double board certified in family practice, and went back and got my psychiatric nurse practitioner. I worked, as he said, a lot of other specialties in the hospital most of the time, cardiology for 15 years, which is really the love of my life prior to doing psychiatry. I know nobody who did cardiology and does psychiatry. I know, it's weird, but it is the truth. Um, when I left cardiology in the hospital, I went to work, I got offered, United Healthcare offered me my own practice um, in Kansas City, my own primary care practice, and it was an experience working for an insurance company doing that, um, but a third of my patients would present to me every day for mental health complaints, and they don't teach that in primary care. They don't teach that. So you're supposed to write an SSRI. It doesn't work. It doesn't work 90% of the time. So what is precision medicine? It's an approach to disease treatment and prevention that takes into account individual variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle for each person. I would extend that to many other things we're going to talk about that I include in precision medicine. I'm motivated by patient advocacy. I've won two awards in my life for throwing my body in front of patients to keep harm from coming to them, and it was from my peers who gave me those awards. That's who I am. I'm going to show you my genetic report so you can understand why, because it's my genes. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It is. Um, so why does it matter? Because we have special populations, children, adolescents, geriatrics, I know you're big push right now. Patients with comorbidities, patients on polypharmacy, nursing home, nursing home, um, severe disease, patients on meds with narrow margins of therapeutics, cardiology, blood thinners, neurology, blood thinners, um, transplant rejection medications, uh, renal or heart failure, just for a few examples. It's got to work. It's got to work right the first time. So pharmacology is complex. It is not insurmountable. When I first saw that 18-page test, I went, oh my god. And there was nobody standing by to tell me how to interpret it. I had to get on the phone, bother Russell Lamato over and over again, have him explain it to me, because I didn't see the patterns right away. It was, it was daunting. Um, the margins are small. The reasons between success and failure can be narrow in most specialties. Trial and error, like uh, you already said earlier, is that traditional mental health relies on a trial and error approach. It's true. I used to say we need to put science back in psychiatry. Having worked in cardiology, you know, you like have a hundred percent expectation of succeeding every day. So it's hard to go from that to the other. And then we're treating people, not disease. Everybody's different. The brain is complex. We don't understand all of it. So my goal today is for you to understand how I got here and how I do what I do. So I consider myself a very enthusiastic user of this test. 
Okay, so I have a solo private practice. I was the first nurse practitioner in Kansas to have her own solo psychiatric practice. After working for United Healthcare, I was motivated to start my own practice. I never wanted to work for anybody ever again. And that's what motivated me to do that. Um, I have 1,300 patients, which is a lot for psychiatry. Um, the majority of referrals, I did not advertise when I started. It was started out with therapists sending me their patients that weren't getting better. Then it was the family members of the patients. Then it was neurologists. Then it was primary care doctors. And it just went crazy. Um, I often use my internal medicine background applied to this. Everything you talk about, I use it every day. Um, I started training other people. People started saying, hey, you do what I want to do for a living. So I've trained four NPs in the last year, all graduating right now. They want to do this, what I do full time. Just want to do gen mics all day long. That's all they're going to do. Because they said, everybody says when I, when I train them, they go, by the middle of day one, they go, why don't we do this on every patient? I go, exactly, you get it. Um, I like speaking to other people. I've been asked recently, I started speaking to lawyers. I want to stop on that one. I'm speaking to lawyers. <coughs> a couple years ago, one of my uh, trainees said, we got she worked in law. And she goes, we got to tell the lawyers. I said, I would not throw my people under the bus. I don't care anymore. So in Vegas, in October, I spoke to the national dis uh, insurance disability lawyers, the insurance companies, and there were doctors there. And I told them, you have to pay for this test and they all shook their head. Um, research, I said I would never do it. Everything I said I would never do. I said I would never do psychiatry. I said I would never do cardiology. I did research and based on this test. And I have no disclosures. Nobody pays me any money to do anything outside of this. It's all of my own accord. Okay, I tell every patient, I'm gonna treat you all like a patient, that your brain is a combination of your genetics that you were born with, which will never change unless you're that Chinese guy that had twins. He wasn't supposed to manipulate his babies. Remember that guy? Okay. Epigenetics is what was done to your brain and learned behavior is your how you interpret those first two things. So my job is to help the first one. So Genomine helps me figure out the first half of the test tells me how you've got the symptoms that you have, and the second half tells me how to safely address those symptoms. And the number one thing it does, and so all my students tell me, they go, because I don't look at the patients when I'm talking as much because I'm typing a lot. And they go, did you see the look on their face when you validated why they feel the way they feel so they don't feel any shame anymore? I go, no. They go, oh my God, but look, every time, I'm like, wow, that's really, it makes me want to cry. What's some basic pharmacology? I didn't know who my audience was today. I just want to kind of go over it's important just to know the basics <coughs> and that we know what pharmacogenetics means. Pharmacodynamics, that's the first half of the test, and that's important for symptoms, and pharmacokinetics is the second half, how drugs are metabolized. So what are the basics of that? So there's nothing more scientific. So if somebody gets in an argument with me about this is voodoo medicine, which I have received that argument, um, there is nothing more scientific than how drugs are metabolized. We cannot debate that. We need to move beyond that now. We know how to metabolize. We know what genes interrupt that. So there's absorption, you swallow a pill. Distribution, how it gets distributed to your tissues. Metabolism is what we're gonna talk about today. And excretion, obviously, what that is. Um, when I start teaching, this is, the, this is the big problem here at Genomine, because you do not teach the first half of the test at all. And so they look at it and go, <clears throat> that means nothing to me. So we quote all the data to people, and the minute you start quoting research studies, you have lost them. That is too much for them, it becomes an argument, because I can quote data all day long, and then we all become logic bullies, and it really don't get anywhere. The best way is to make it simple, all right? So when I'm teaching students how to read this, I say focus on these six genes that mean the most to me in the first half of the test. And I get to say this, you may not be able to, but I can. If you've got, oh sorry, if you've got a double risk allele on the SLC684, which means you're here an S slash S or an LG slash LG, it means two things to me. One, SSRIs are not the first choice for you. They probably aren't going to work very well. And they're going to validate why the SSRIs didn't work on you've already taken four of. And number two, I call that the sweet gene. If you're a double bad on this, and I, I don't know how many people in this room have this test done, I wish every one of you did. I'm just, I don't mean to shame you, but you, to learn this, you have to do it. Seeing your own test will change your life. Anyway, if you're double uh, briskly on that, which is my youngest daughter, they tend to be more sensitive to the world and nice, and that's like less than 10% of the population. So how I get to explain this is, you're the nice one. Okay, you have to understand how to deal with the 90% of us. I don't want that gene. My job is to protect those people. But they are the finest human beings, all right? And they are great, but only, you know, I call them Mother Teresa gene. I have all these funny names for it so the patients can remember. It's so, it, I'm teaching, okay?
okay? And we could go through all the data, and I do, I tell patients, hey, I want you to look this up, but this is how they remember it, okay? The MTHFR, we have funny, everybody knows the nickname for the MTHFR. Um, so if you're 70% reduced, you're only making 30% of your dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and melatonin, focus, relaxation, wakefulness, and sleep. Do you hear what I just said? I'm tired, I can't sleep, I'm sad, I don't know why, I feel overwhelmed. Over, uh, my, my favorite student says, she loves it when I say, I feel overwhelmed because they're not making the neurotransmitters that do all the job in the brain. So they feel bad all their lives and they feel like there's something wrong with them and there is not. That is a lot of shame to remove. People go crazy, especially with children who can't focus. That's amazing and that's fixable. You give them l methyl folate and they make 100%. Yay, yay, right? Um, COMT tells me a lot about a person. It tells me how you maintain dopamine in the front of your brain. If it hangs out too long, I'm gonna to point to all the pharmacists in this room. They're all meth meds. <laughs> Right? Am I wrong? Is there a not that in this room, Mark? Oh, no, no. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> You're an anomaly, man. Russell? You want that. Met you know that. <laughs> no way. What is it with this? Oh my God. All my, all my lives. That's the, so engine, if you drive by the engine, my husband's an engineer. They're almost all of them. Met say if I should don't be in front of the brain. They're overthinkers. We want that person building the bridge, right? Because they don't. My husband, he's a nerd. I, I call it the nerd gene, okay? Now, but anyway, if you're a valve valve, you have less dopamine in front of the brain, and there are much more advantages to that and disadvantages. Advantages being, uh, I'm a doer, okay? I'm more likely to take chances, more, more likely to take risks. Tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm a doer. I will jump in front of the bus when somebody's coming down the street. I'll save a life, I'll run into the house on fire. That, that's over there thinking about it. <laughs> I'm not joking, it's true. I was in the army. You and I would be right side by side. Russ will be in the back, solving all our problems, making all the guys. <laughs> okay, so, and then if you're about that, you're normal, that's me. So I'm a, I know, actually, I light up normal on the CMT, which is a shock. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, I keep it the wrong button. This is the gene for ADRA, aka hyperactivity. I call it the fast brain. It's the best way to remember. Would it shock you that I light up double bad on that? Like, <laughs> and it's not a very common, it's very uncommon. When I saw that, it changed my life. ANK3, the CAN, CAC, NA1C, the two most important genes to me on this entire test. This is the gated ion channels that control cars getting on the highways, cars, neurotransmitters getting on the neurons. So if there's a problem with the gate, and I've had so many conversations with Dr. Amato about this over and over again, I see tons of anxiety and depression in these people. Okay, and there is research to support that, especially with this, in my, I have a one bad in the CAC. So what do you think happens if you give an antidepressant that increases the cars on the highway, but you haven't fixed the gates, you make them worse. I see this all day <coughs> long. Okay, you give an SSRI to somebody lights up bad here, most of the time they don't do as well. So you gotta fix the gate first. I call that the gated community, all right? And I'm a member. But I see a lot of creativity in those people, a lot of creative problem solving, a lot of energy, good stuff. Okay, so this is my test. This is old, because I've been around for a while. Um, so you'll see that um, I'm intermediate, so who cares about that? This is very rare, I'm not gonna tell you about it now. This is my, I bet 55% less neurotransmitters, notable. Um, and then this is what changed my life, seeing this. I'm like, what does that mean? <coughs> Anybody here have a GG? Any other GGs? I told you I'm not very common. Mm -hmm. I think Joe Mar is a GG, and I will go on record for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm almost positive. So we are, G stands for go, all right? So fast brain, fast, fast, fast. To us, everybody else is really slow, okay? <laughs> but I call this the border collie gene. My job is to babysit you, okay? And it makes you very anxious, because I'm noticing everything all the time. That's my genetic job. There aren't a lot of us, we don't need a lot of border collies, okay? So this would be the gene if I had likely, likelihood of ADD. So I have HD with no AD, and we're very different than the ADHD, straight ADHDs. We are, we're more fast, which makes us even more anxious. And then you'll see I have a little gate issue right here. Okay, this is a good story, this is my daughter. When I first started doing this, she had been diagnosed with ADHD at the age of three. I mean, you could tell in diapers that she had it. And she was swimming along until about age nine where it got really bad and the, the teachers were like, you have to medicate her. And I'm like, okay, I guess we will. So we went along the traditional psychiatric route. I got a formal testing, tons of stuff. I did everything right. 
like, yeah, for sure, she's got ADHD. I'm like, okay. So I just did whatever they told me to do. So they started putting her on medication. So she, she got a border collie. This is the thing that we're gonna talk about right now. So the second half of the test is how drugs are metabolized. A very important pathway is a CYP2D6 for ADHD medications. And you'll see she is low activity, meaning she doesn't break them down. So what do you think happens if you give amphetamines to a young child who doesn't break them down? So we thought, looking back now, I had no idea uh, the shame that I feel now, is she, they made her feel awful. And so we just tried version after version, and every time she was, and we just thought she was being difficult. So what does it mean when I say somebody's a poor metabolizer? This is the four options when we're talking about drug metabolism. You're either a fast metabolizer, normal, intermediate, or poor. So right now I'm kind of talking about poor metabolism. So what percentage of drugs do you think go down that pathway that she's a poor metabolizer of? The answer is what? I wish. <laughs> it's 25%, but it's 32% of psych meds. So there's a one in three chance I'm gonna write a drug that goes down that pathway. So if a patient is a poor metabolizer and a lot of very important drugs go down this outside of psychiatry, there's a chance I'm gonna hurt them. So if you look on her test, look what it says right here next to Adderall. Serum levels may be increased. Okay, so that was causing the problem and I didn't believe her. So I read her her test and the first thing she said to me, and you gotta hear this, is so I'm not stupid. At the time she was flunking out of high school. I was constantly mad at her. I didn't know what's wrong with her. She's just faster than all of us, okay? And she was bored and I didn't understand it. I was judging her and so we got her off the medication. I showed her genomine to her psychiatrist. I was so excited to show her genomine, and he actually orders them for a living, so he should be able to read them. And I handed it to him, and he goes, I don't think any other drug will work as well. And I'm like, you're fired. I'm out of here. <laughs> I told my husband that day I would become the best person ever lived at reading this test, because I will never let that happen to somebody else's kid. That should never happen, okay? So that was the beginning of my journey was that day. So now, we get her off medication. What she really needed was anxiety medication. We missed the boat all the way. She goes to college, she just applied to medical school. Double majored in microbiology, anthropology, works with children, and doing research now, Kate. The girl that was funky out of high school. Okay, see how you, you, the story you tell yourself that isn't true? This is the shame you remove with your test. Do you understand the power of this test? Every one of you needs this test. All right, so if you type this into her Gen Med Pro, amazing. There you go. Shouldn't have done it. We should have just used it. And then, funny story about her is she had COVID last fall, and her boyfriend, fiance, gave her Delson cough syrup, and she called me. She goes, you know, I hallucinated on that stuff. I go, what pathway does it go down? And how many times have I told you to ask? I don't know. I said, it's too, I said, this made dextromethorphan into a psych med. It just came out. So she tripped on Delson because of her genetics. A few months before that, her liver enzymes quadrupled. I thought she was an alcoholic and lying to me. Straight up, can't make it up. I go, what are you taking? She goes, just ashwagandha. I go, what pathway does it go down? I don't know. I said, the 2D6, and how many times did it have this conversation? Stop doing it. She gets it now. So pharmacokinetics, second, second half of the test, precision medicine, your age, your gastrointestinal, renal, and liver function, other drugs that you're taking, and your genes. Okay, case studies. I know you guys are working on the geriatric population, so I brought you three recent three case studies in mind. The first one is a patient was very near and dear to me. She was a primary care patient that I saw beforehand, so I knew her really well. And she had progressive joint pain and swelling, really bad, like debilitating. Shortness of breath, she all of a sudden her O2 sats were going down, nobody knew what was going on. Um, so she was started on the journey of chronic prednisone. She gained hundred pounds, she was five feet tall, but she couldn't breathe. So she comes to me, she's depressed, she's the single mother of two adult kids who are special needs in their 30s, and she can't work, and she's suicidal. And she knew me from before. So this is what her test shows. So what do you see again? 2D6, okay? This is the drug she was on the day I saw her on that day. Everything in red has a drug to drug interaction. Everything in bold red has a genetic drug interaction. Holy crap, that, is nor that happens all the time. All the time. In cardiology, that's a normal drug. Okay, so this is this is what her, if you type it into the Gen Metro, which I use every day, all day, this is what it looks like. Look at that. Look at all those warning signs. Hello? 
Okay, so for her mental health, I stabilized her using genomine on Vibrid, Lotus Lithium, Clonazepam, and Pregabalin. How pretty is that? Hello? Okay, so she's being followed. <laughs> I'm very passionate about <laughs> She's being followed by many other specialties. Again, very common. I worked in academia, oh my God. And none of us would talk to each other. Why would we do that, right? So pulmonology, rheumatology, cardiology, primary care, neurology, immunology, podiatry, and pain management. Neurology goes, oh, you have headaches? Let us give you amitriptyline. I told her to swear to me, tell me if anybody ever has any medications, just like my daughter. Did she tell me? No. So she started having these amitriptyline. I am describing serotonin syndrome, which is quite serious in psychiatry. She was admitted to the hospital with all these symptoms. They spent a whole week working her up, $50,000 workup. They never discovered what was wrong with her. She was discharged from the hospital, called me on the phone a week later. I go, what they had? They have a trip to leave. She's already on a serotonergic drug, and she's, you know, there you go. We just stopped the amitriptyline, and she was fine. So what do you think it costs for that admission? How many patients could have gotten a Genomine for that one admission? I did the math, it's 125. Frequency of drug interactions, 1.3 million ER visits a year. If you ever worked in ER, you can totally believe this. You were at 50, go on to be admitted to the hospital. So I did some math, which I'll show you in a second. So, and again, the older you are, the more risk there is. What's the financial cost of untreated mental health? About $50, million, $50 billion a year in the United States alone. And then, that's how many people could have gotten a genomine for all these admissions. Now that's on my data. When I looked at your handout that you just put in, it's that many people. 340 <coughs> million people could get a genomine if we just got, we start using a genomine. This is nonsensical to me. This is not efficient. Which is typical of medicine. After 35 years of working in it, it is not efficient. Okay. Case study number two, 75 year old female, depression, severe, comorbidity of atrial fibrillation and depression, uh, um, hypertension. She falls trying to pick up her husband who is disabled and breaks two discs in her back. Um, she's depressed. She lost her adult son to cancer not that long ago and she's overwhelmed. So typing in the meds, this is a med she's on when I meet her. I'm just showing you the yellow and red and arrows are all bad. Okay, bad, bad, bad. So I weaned her off venlafaxine because you see that venlafaxine had some interactions for her, okay? And it wasn't working. So this happens all the time. You're on a bunch of drugs, nobody ever takes you off, they don't work, why don't we take you off? I have no idea. They just don't, they just had another. So I weaned her off venlafaxine, put her on Vibrid, it worked. But what about the other drugs she's on, the blood thinner for atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation, we don't need your blood to be that thin it needs to be between 2.0 and 2.5 if you're on Coumadin. And is there a substitute for blood thinner, blood pressure medicine, and the stomach medicine she all had problems with? The answer is yes. Why don't we fix that too? So that's what it looks like when you fix it. So you switch your blood thinner to Eliquis, Metoprolol. She's still on these. Fiber's working. That's the old one. There's a new one. Tell you said this is not hard. It's not hard at all. It's so easy. It kills me how easy this is. Okay, third one, 74 year old female, neurology referred her to me. She had a basal stem stroke, that's the worst part, the base of your brain, like where you breathe and walk from. So if you're thinning the blood of that person, you wanna make sure you're thinning their blood. So what does it say? We got some problems here, all right? Your propion wasn't doing anything, why is she even on your propion? It's not doing anything. So we switched her to a different blood thinner and kept her on injection because it was really working. That's how, we can see we went from that, how fast we can do that. It just, it's not hard, it's so easy. Okay, so this is what it looks like when you show it to my people. We're like, forest through the trees, oh! <laughs> <laughs> More work! And this is how I felt immediately after. <laughs> <laughs> you know who this is? This is Graham Chapman. He's actually a doctor. He was a doctor before he went into Monty Python. This is the upper middle class twit. If you've never seen that skit, it's the funniest one I've ever seen in my life. That's exactly how I felt. What have I been doing for the past 30 years, mindlessly writing drugs, not understanding this? And you guys need to understand how we got there so you can get us out of it, okay? So um, this is a lesson in neuroscience. I went on a journey to understand why I swallowed Kool-Aid. 
So I worked in academia, and in the 10 years I rounded with residents, I never heard a single doctor mention drug to drug interactions. Forget genetics. Not one time. Like, it kills, because that would have been slowed us down. So, you have to teach how people to unlearn stuff, right? We're cognitively lazy. It's basically, we, the brain doesn't want to change because that would take effort and make risk. Um, what are the two biases involved here? Confirmation bias, I see what I expect to see, and desirability, I see what I want to see. So when you're talking to people, that's what's going on is, well, my friend is doing this, so this must be right. And I'm already overwhelmed, so I'm gonna just continue on the way things are. Smart people are better at manipulating the world than not smart people. The higher your IQ, the more likely you are to be able to change the world the way you want to. So it can be frustrating talking to a person who can do that, but not impossible, there's a way to do it. So it's called the overconfidence cycle, and people, there's actually, this is Adam Grant, if you've not read his book, I strongly recommend it again. If you're a salesperson, you have to read this book. So it's all about how the brain works and how we get to this believing in stuff that's not true. And so he talks about the overconfidence cycle, so people that actually know the most know the least. So your humble people, those farm people in the back, they're usually the smartest people you're ever gonna meet in your life, and they're very humble about it, very. So this is the problem, it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which you don't even know you're stupid. I don't mean to be judgy. <laughs> but the people that are most confident aren't even aware, right? Does that make sense? And then the humble, people are humble, that leads to doubt, which leads to curiosity, which leads to discovery. So it's the single most important driver of success, and, and actually people that are good, smartest people in the world are best at unlearning than everybody else, seeing things differently. Right, a lot of things what your new CEO is talking about today. So you have to think like a scientist, if you just be open-minded, if you're willing to be wrong. Russell taught me this. So when I went to do research, I was like terrified of being wrong. He's like, oh no, that's what you've learned, is that you're wrong. I'm like, okay, I guess I'll let go of it. <laughs> like, I get used to disappointment. The purpose of learning isn't to affirm, it's to evolve them, okay? And then it starts with intellectual humility, knowing what we don't know. So when I was doing this, I noticed on that gate, that one gate gene, that those people, Russell was teaching me, and he said, what about low-dose lithium? I said, low-dose lithium, that's for people that are bipolar. And they never talked about it in school. He goes, oh, no, no, lithium has all these benefits. And he did research on rats, and he hit them on the head, and the ones on lithium had no brain damage. He hit rats on the head. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And I'm like, old drug, lots of benefit. I was reminds me of metformin, which is another drug that has all these other benefits. Metformin is a miracle drug. It's amazing, but it's five dollars a month, so nobody will do any research on it. Lithium is the same thing, and I'm like, and it takes so long to get a new drug out, and so I'm like, repurposing an old drug—that's a good idea. Let me start writing it and see how it works. So I decided to do research on it because I just couldn't believe how well it worked. And then all these other psychiatrists, Dr. Roger McIntyre—they're all saying, "Write low dose lithium, write low dose lithium." I'm like, "Well, where's the evidence? Nobody's doing any research. I guess I'll do research." And so I did, and so. That gated gene is strongly associated with bipolar disorder, and it's hard to discern um, bipolar disorder and straight depression. And it's really important what we talked about it because if you give the wrong drugs, you'll make them worse. And this, I just did one this week on a young lady that was told she was bipolar at eight, yet they never once wore her mood stabilizer. And now she's 24. I'm like, that's fascinating. So um, it would help me to use the test to be able to differentiate is there, is there a likelihood? You can't go. Because somebody has a gene doesn't mean they have the presentation. This is really important. I only see the people that are complaining. I don't see the millions of people that have no complaint that have these genes, the elder risk alleles. But the ones that are complaining, it works. And so it just leads me to the, a closer to the truth, okay? A closer version of the truth. Again, in precision medicine, you're taking everything into account, not just their genes. So nonetheless, it is helpful to see that. And here's, there's some research on this. And then differentiating, I feel, as we talked about, bipolar from major depressive. And then lithium has, there is some research on that is beneficial. So my study was people over 18 years of old diagnosed with any mood disorder, anxiety, depression, bipolar, um, that had a risk allele, the CHC, NA1C, an A or a double A, that's what we're looking for. And I did PHQ-9 scores, which is the typical questionnaire for depression, and GAD-7, which is your typical uh, question for anxiety and it's a number. Look at this. This is the preliminary data that just came out this week. I'm freaked out, but this is exactly what I see in practice. This was their pre-anxiety scores. Look at after. 
Now we're not talking about high dose lithium, I'm bipolar. We're talking about 300 milligrams, 600 milligrams. This is crazy. This drug is five dollars a month. It has other benefits. It's been shown to maybe prevent Alzheimer's disease. It's anti-inflammatory for the brain. It improves um, the rebuilding of neurons. It protects rats from getting hit on the head. <laughs> okay. So this is what I'm trying to say is your test prompted me to do this, and we have to do more research on drugs that are less than ten dollars a month. Okay. Because people are afraid, and the, the toxicity of lithium comes in the dosing. So if I can write you low dose, and I can show you're going to get this much better, hello, and this is three and four year data. This is not six weeks. This is patients I've been seeing for three and four years, from six weeks to four years. And this is the actual before numbers. And I've never done research in my life, and I was terrified. But he was right. Okay? I had to unlearn, because I had the uh, nirvana thing about lithium, too. So, significant. So, what is the, shows that pharmacogenetics is an effective tool for predicting lithium efficacy, a low dose lithium, and a significantly de decreased depression and anxiety compared to baseline. Okay, the FDA. So I counted it last week. The FDA now on the package inserts <coughs> on 543 drugs. It was 200 when I first started doing this. It says you need to know the person's metabolic pharmacokinetic genes before you write this particular drug. My best friend is a nurse practitioner who worked at Shirkardi and Bacon for seven, eight years defending pharmaceutical companies. And she is all over this. Because she thinks this is, the, she is more enthusiastic than me about the gen Y. And she's been researching this meeting with attorneys. <laughs> so when she defended the pharmaceutical companies, if it's on the insert, and let's say your hair falls out from Taxotere, which is actually a lawsuit that's going on right now that she helped defend. Your hair falls out, you can't sue Taxotere, it was in Taxotere, it's my fault. I'm the first partner. That's the bottom line, that's what you need to know. So my people need to know that 543 drugs <coughs> are not my fault. And I'm not psychic, I can't tell if you're a slow metabolizer of the 2D6. So this is coming, you are at the precipice of what is about to happen, and you will be rock stars when my people are freaking out going to help us understand this. We have to have this tool. When I worked in cardiology, people would come back with heart attack two months after starting clavis. Why did that happen? We don't know. Probably this. I once gave post-op pain medication to a little old lady, and I thought she stopped breathing. I thought I had killed her instantly. I stood by the cold light for seven hours. And I'm pretty sure she has a particular gene where she's a rapid metabolizer of that drug, so she broke it down too fast, and I almost killed her. I had no idea. So we're not going to be able to say we don't know anymore because they're putting it on our drug labeling. So what are the legal implications? There's a really great study that came out. This interesting law professor wrote this in 2020. This is, you guys should all read this. It's good. Um, widespread clinical uptake of genetics could have li liability, not liability, for providers. When does the standard of care change? It's happening. So like in anything, medicine, the standard of care will change and it will become the norm. So perceived harm, if I don't do it, if I do it but do it wrong, um, sorry, I wrote that twice, I apologize. Misinterpretation, uh, I read it wrong, I've seen that, I've seen other providers misinterpret it when I was in training, badly, they did not understand it. Um, failure to prescribe this, and did it, you know, did they get one before I met them, and I, am I accountable for, if they tell me that, do I, am I, yes, it's like having a CT scan from two years ago, I should be, I should be accountable for that. Okay, so I really want to take a minute. I really do. Really, honestly, I'm gonna cry. Those two boys are changing the world with what they have done. Nobody has ever done this before. It's gotta be really difficult to do, for the, to be the first ones to do it, because my people aren't doing it enough. And this has to change. This has to change. I'm trying my best from every angle to make my people do it, okay? And so, your moms will be proud of you. <laughs>
treatment resistant depression. Yeah. Is it really that or is it really trial and error prescribing? Okay, so to do it correctly, you have to you have to know their brain, what happened to their brain, and how they interpret it, and then I can answer the question. Okay. What do you feel about ketamine intravenous? I have very I've seen varied results. For some people it really works. It depends on their genetics. Okay. I had a patient who had two rounds of ketamine, twenty thousand dollars. She never got better. She was a rapid metabolizer. That would have been nice to know before they were recommended the third dose. She was suicidal at that point. So I've mixed. I've seen mixed results. Ketamine is very strict. Like you have to have tried seventy drugs, and you have to still be on an antidepressant, and it's just a lot. And kind of like the psilocybin, the psychedelics, it's all about atmosphere where you give it. So there's a lot of things to go into ketamine. I I don't dislike it. That's the best I can say about it. This is wonderful, by the way. I'm getting a lot in the last. Thanks. Thanks. I did it. Does anybody else have a question? Yeah. First of all, thank you so much. Well, we could bottle your passion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's what we thank you for sharing what we've learned. Uh, how do you break down the barriers between the different silos of specialties? Motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. So, motivational interviewing is me asking you a question. Research, it's really easy. So, it's like instead of me judging you, like for example, Went to my cardiologist last week, who was the guy I used to work with, he's my favorite, he's the smartest, nicest guy in the world. I said, do you know what I do for a living now? He goes, no. And I go, I do this genetic test, and da da da. He goes, I thought I read that doesn't apply to our drugs. <laughs> I said, you think your drugs go down different pathways than other medicines drugs? Well, I read that. And I'm like, you don't remember pharmacology. And you're the best cardiologist in Kansas City. And I actually, I never get mad, and I leaned over, I go, you're either gonna be ahead of this or behind it. And by the end of the session, he goes, will you do one on my daughter? And I'm like, there you go, that's it, you got it, you got it. But I was, I, you, I need you to understand, they don't understand pharmacology at all. When I say at all, now, in medical school now, they are starting to teach genetics, they are teaching this, but they're not using it when they get out. And the, the gene site tool is so lame. It's so lame, it's actually, to me it's libelous. I'm gonna say it, because it gives you limited data and it, it, it misinterprets that data because it's not enough data. So I did one gene site and never did another one, because I'm like, this is not helpful. And they look at red, yellow, green, that's ridiculous. I mean, it's like kindergarten, so. You, you, don't, you, don't, use any inter you, don't, you don't use any interpretation, you have to think. But this is, go I, my model is I spend an hour with the patients on the first visit, then a half hour every time after. <coughs> I spend a half hour interpreting it, I go through every line, like, and then we, we will refer to it back every time I see them. I use a GenMed Pro every single time. It literally takes me under a minute. It is not slow me down. I have 1,300 patients. That's a lot. And I really only see patients till 1 o'clock every day. I'm not kidding. I do admin till 11 o'clock at night. But that's not because of you. So it's, it does not slow me down. In fact, um, I got a call last night from a pharmacist who I've known for a while. And she said, my daughter has depression. And she goes, will you please see her? And she's 10 years old. And she goes, I won't let anybody else touch her. It's because of this. The people that know, know, and they're, they're like fanatical, because it's true. This is not voodoo, this is 100% science. And yes, you will get pushback, but you have to learn how to ask. You ask questions instead of throwing data at them. When I realized when I was talking to a cardiologist, it, it upset him that I knew and he didn't. I came at him wrong, but I, he caught me off guard. I won't do it again. Okay. Yeah. That's your second time public speaking. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One other thing I know is that we are underutilizing you, so we need to fix that. Um, so we need to get you speaking for us more often. I have been an unofficial regent of my first for five years. That. I'm serious. No, I, all of the, I, I had a colonoscopy last week, and I told two of the pre op people, <laughs> two of the post op people, <laughs> They're done. I got them. I'm, like, oh. <laughs> I'm wondering if we could get some of your slides. That you can have all these histories were just incredible. You can have, I have hundreds. Really I have hundreds. So, I have one every you day. So much. Welcome. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>